Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearsonet Excel International Level Chemistry Unit 3 for May 2021. So let's begin with question 1. Question 1 says, the white solid sodium sulfate and potassium carbonate may be distinguished using a phlegm test. A says identify a material from which the phlegm test wire could be made. And they want you to justify your answer. So here I say it should be made out of nichrome because you know nichrome is a mixture of nickel and chromium. So this does not react or you can say it does not give a flame color. That is why it's suitable for it to be used. The next part says describe how to carry out a flame test on a solid giving the expected flame color for each of these compounds. You need to begin by dipping the nichrome wire into concentrated hydrochloric acid in order for it to be cleaned. And then you can dip the wire into the paste of the solid which is mixed with a concentrated hydrochloric acid. Then you place the wire into the blue part of the flame, or you could say the blue part of the Brunson flame. The sodium will show a yellow flame color, while potassium will show a lilac flame color. Because the other said we have two white solids, one is solid sodium sulfate and the other is solid potassium carbonate. So of the two, potassium will give a lilac color and sodium will give a flame color, which is yellow. Moving on. Here they say sodium sulfate and potassium carbonate may also be distinguished using chemical tests. They say give chemical tests for each compound which could confirm the identity of the anions, include the expected result. So we have two anions, one is sulfate, the other is a carbonate. To test for presence of a sulfate, you need to add hydrochloric acid followed by barium chloride. And if a white precipitate is observed, that is proof that it's a sulfate. For the carbonate, to the sample, you need to add hydrochloric acid, and if effervescence is observed, that confirms presence of a carbonate. So this brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. Question two, this question is about the reactions of three compounds with a formula carbon-6, hydrogen-12, oxygen. The compounds are cyclohexanol, Z, hex-3, in, 1, O, and we have one methyl cyclopentanol. So they are that, that, and that. The first question says give a chemical test to show the presence of the OH group in all three compounds, include the expected results. Now to test for presence of the OH group, you can use two things. One, you could use PCO5, and if misty fumes are observed, that is a confirmation that that is an OH group. Or you could use sodium. If you observe effervescence, that is confirmation that there is an OH group present. The next part says, Give a chemical test to show the presence of a carbon-carbon double bond in Z hex 3 in 1 O. So they wanted to include the expected results. To test for presence of a carbon-carbon double bond, we can use bromine water. And if bromine water turns from brown to callous, or you could say orange to callous, that is confirmation of a carbon-carbon double bond. On the other hand, we could also use potassium manganate 7. If a purple color turns to callous, that is confirmation of presence of a carbon-carbon double bond. The next part says, the test you have given in B1 is repeated with 1 methyl cyclopentanol. They say give the observation for this test with 1 methyl cyclopentanol. So for this, if I use bromine water, the brown-orange color of bromine water will persist because there is no carbon-carbon double bond. If you can see back here, here we have no carbon-carbon double bond, so the color will persist if I used bromine water. Also, if I use potassium magnet 7, the proper color will not be changed. And that would be proof that there is no carbon-carbon double bond. Let's continue. Here they say separate samples of each of these compounds was warmed with acidified potassium dichromate 6. They want you to complete the table to give the color changes observed, if any. Acidified potassium dichromate 6 is an oxidizing agent, so primary alcohols as well as secondary alcohols can be oxidized. The primary alcohol can be oxidized to an aldehyde or carboxylic acid. We can see this one here. The secondary alcohol can be oxidized to a ketone, but the tertiary alcohol cannot be oxidized. So with this secondary alcohol, we will see an observation of orange to green. This primary alcohol will be orange to green, but this tertiary alcohol will see no observable change because it cannot be oxidized. Moving on. Here they say spectroscopy provides information about the structure of these three compounds. Some infrared data is given in the table. So we have that. The first question says, identify the wave number range and the bond responsible for one peak which you would expect to see 
in the infrared spectra of all three compounds. You remember all three compounds, let me take you back slowly. All three compounds have the OH group in them, meaning they can have the oxygen-hydrogen bond for alcohols, which is that. So here I wrote the range should be 3750 to 3200 due to the OH bond. The next part says identify the wave number range and the bond responsible for one peak, which you would expect to see in the infrared spectra of only one of the three compounds. Again, I want to take you back. We can see it's only this compound here that has a carbon-carbon double bond, so I would expect a specific range to be shown for this, or I would expect a peak to be shown for this that is absent in the other two. This is the carbon-carbon double bond stretch within alkenes, so here I say the range should be 1669 to 1645 due to the carbon-carbon double bond. Down here they say give a reason why there is a peak at mass to charge 100 in the mass spectra of all three compounds. Because this is a mass spectra, all three compounds have the same molecular ion. So I said the molecular ions of all the three compounds are at mass to charge 100. So that is, or you could say they all have the same molecular mass, which is 100 gram per mole. Moving on. Here they say a fragmentation of one methyl cyclopentanol results in a significant peak at mass to charge 85. They want you to suggest the structures of the two species formed when one bond in one methyl cyclopentanol breaks resulting in the peak at mass to charge 85. Remember we saw they all have molecular mass 100 and we know a CH3 is equal to 15. 85 is 100 minus 15 so it means for this fragmentation to occur a CH3 has to break away. So when I broke away the CH3 I remained with this species as well as this radical. So this brings us to the end of question 2. Let's continue to question 3. Question 3. A saturated solution of barium hydroxide was formed by adding barium oxide to water until no more would dissolve. The equation for the reaction is given as this one here. They say the resulting mixture was filtered to remove excess solid. The concentration of barium hydroxide solution was formed by titrating portions of the saturated solution with hydrochloric acid of known concentration. Then 10 centimeters cubed portions of the saturated barium hydroxide solution were placed in conical flasks and titrated with 0.2 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid added from a burette. Three drops of methyl orange indicator were added to the solution in each conical flask. They say state the color change observed at the end of the titration. The color should change from yellow to orange. Then the next part says some of the results are shown. Complete the table. To complete the table here, we had to subtract that minus that to get this. And for this one here, we, add, we had to add these two to get that because this is the difference between that and that. Then the next part says give a reason why the first titer should not be used to calculate the main titer. Here you have to check if the results are concordant, but according to my check, I realized the first results was not concordant with the other results. If you can see the difference between this and that, as well as the difference between that and the others, they are not concordant results. Concordant results are going to be in within plus or minus 0.2, or some people say plus or minus 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other. So tighter one was not concordant. So let's continue. Here they say calculate the number of moles of hydrochloric acid in the mean tighter. To do that, we had to get a concordant result, add the volumes, and then divide by three to get the mean tighter. And then the moles of hydrochloric acid should be concentration times volume. The concentration uses 0.2, and the volume is this one here, but I converted it to decimeters cubed, and that becomes my final answer. Next here they say the equation for the reaction in the titration is that they want you to calculate the concentration of barium hydroxide in gram per decimeter cubed, giving your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. So I began by calculating the moles of barium hydroxide because I was given the information, remember, the reaction is between barium hydroxide and HCl, and if I have the moles of HCl here, I can go back to the equation, and I can know that the moles of barium hydroxide should be half the moles of HCl. So since they use 10 centimeters cubed of barium hydroxide, I can say the moles of barium hydroxide in 10 centimeters cubed should be 1 over 2 times the moles of HCl, which is a half of that, giving me that. From there, I can find the concentration of barium hydroxide in mole per decimeter cubed, and they should be number of moles divided by volume, 
which is the number of moles here, divided by the volume, which is 10 centimeters cubed. But again, I have to convert that volume to decimeters cubed. That is why I divide it by 1,000. So the final concentration in mole per decimeter cubed is that. However, I had to convert that concentration in gram per decimeter cubed. And to do that, I have to multiply the concentration in mole per decimeter cubed times the molar mass. And that times the molar mass, which is that, gave me that, which is 37.4 rounded off to three significant figures is 37.4 gram per decimeter cubed. Moving on. Here they say solid samples of soluble barium compounds such as barium oxide are toxic by inhalation due to the presence of barium ions. Give a safety precaution that should be used to minimize the risk when adding barium oxide to water. So one thing I have to know is you have to use a fume cupboard because they say they are toxic. So use a fume cupboard. Here they say barium also forms a peroxide. A bottle of barium peroxide has the hazard symbol, this one here. They want you to state the meaning of this symbol. This symbol means oxidizing, so that should be your answer. This brings us to the end of question three. Let's continue to question four. Question four, a sample of one bromobutane may be prepared by reacting butan 1 0 with sodium bromide and 50% concentrated sulfuric acid. The procedure is as below. So step one, they, want, they say add suitable quantities of butan 1 0 and sodium bromide solution to a round bottom flask and place the flask in a cold water bath. Add concentrated sulfuric acid drop by drop to the flask. In step two, they want you to heat the mixture in the flask and the reflux for about 45 minutes. In step three, they say rearrange the apparatus for distillation and distill the reaction mixture. The distillate collected contains one bromobutane and water in separate layers. Remove as much of the water layer as possible. Step four, transfer the impure one bromobutane to a separating funnel and add sodium hydrogen carbonate solution and shake the mixture. Then run off the organic layer into a clean conical flask. Step five, add anhydrous calcium chloride, stop at the flask and allow it to stand and then you can decant. This is a drying agent. Then step six, distill the water over suitable temperature range uh, to give the pure one bromobutane. So I, I know this one here, this is a drying agent, so it's gonna be to remove water from the organic liquid and this sodium hydrogen carbonate is used to neutralize, removing the excess acid that has remained from the reaction. So here they've given us the set of data, density, as well as molar mass and boiling point. The first question says, suggest why the percentage yield of one bromobutane might be lower if the cold water bath was not used in step one. Now we need to know that this is an exothermic reaction and a lot of heat is going to be generated. If cooling does not occur, the generated heat is going to cause the boiling of the product. So here I said the reaction is exothermic, so heat is generated. If cooling does not occur, the product may evaporate, leading to a lower yield. Let's continue. Here they say instead what must be added to the mixture in the flask before heating in step two. We have to add anti-bumping granules so that the mixture boils smoothly. The next part says draw a label diagram of the apparatus that you would use to heat the mixture under reflux in step two. So here I put a refluxing condenser. There is a round bottom flask. There is a sample you're boiling inside. Here, this is the source of heat. We can see the condenser is placed vertically. Cold water is coming in here and the water that has been used for cooling it goes out to the other side. This part here has to be open. So if you had drawn it like this, you would get the three marks. Moving on. Here they say purification of the product occurs in steps three to six. They want you to state why sodium hydrogen carbonate solution is added in step four. Like I already said, sodium hydrogen carbonate is there to neutralize in order to remove the excess acid that was used in the reaction. Then the next part says, Addition of sodium hydrogen carbonate in step four causes vigorous effervescence. Explain how the problem associated with step four should be dealt with. This kind of question requires you to state the problem and then give a solution. So my problem or the problem that occurs is there is buildup of pressure in the separating funnel. And how can we solve that problem? You could remove the stopper when the separating funnel is vertically upright, or you could open the tap when the stopper or separating funnel is inverted so that the pressure is lost in order to prevent the buildup of gas 
in the separating funnel. The next part says give the purpose of the anhydrous calcium chloride used in step 5. Anhydrous calcium chloride is a drying agent, so its purpose here is to remove water from the organic liquid. The next part says state how the appearance of the organic liquid would change in step 5. The organic liquid is going to change from cloudy to a clear appearance. If there is some water in the organic liquid, it's going to be cloudy and putting a drying agent that removes the water causes the liquid to turn clear. Moving on. Here they say for the final distillation in step 6, a thermometer with a scale giving readings to the nearest 1 degree Celsius was provided. They say give a suitable temperature range for the collection of pure 1 bromobutane. Now we know that the boiling temperature is 102 degrees, so the sample can be collected 2 degrees lower or 2 degrees higher. Some people could say 3 degrees lower, 3 degrees higher, it doesn't matter, but I usually use 2 degrees plus or minus 2. So to add minus 2, I get 100, and to plus 2, I get 104. So for me, this was my range. The next part says a student was asked to prepare 20 centimeters cubed of 1 bromobutane using the procedure described. The student knew that the percentage yield would be less than 100%. Give one possible reason for the yield being less than 100%. Yield can be lower due to transfer losses. It could be lower due to the reaction not being complete. Then they say after some research, the student decided to use 21 grams of butan 1 all to prepare 20 centimeters cubed of 1 bromobutane. They wanted to calculate the percentage yield that the student expected to obtain. Now to do this, since I'm given the mass of this, I needed to find the number of moles. The number of moles are going to be mass divided by molar mass, which is 21 divided by 74. This value is given in the table, so I got that. Now I'm going to use this because the reaction ratio is 1 to 1. I'm going to use this. These are the same moles of the product, which is 1 bromobutane. So the theoretical moles, or the moles if there is a 100% yield, should be that as well. I'm talking about the moles of 1 bromobutane if the yield was 100%. Those are the theoretical moles. They should be 0 0.2837 moles. And since I know that, I can find the theoretical mass, or the mass of 1 bromobutane if there is a 100% yield. That should be number of moles times the molar mass, which is that times that. Again, this is given in the table. When I multiplied, I got that as the theoretical mass or the mass of 1 bromobutane if the yield was 100%. The next part, I wanted to find the actual mass of 1 bromobutane that is going to be required. Since I'm given the volume and I know the density from the table, mass can be density times volume and it gave me 25.4 grams. Now, this is the actual mass or you could say actual yield. That is the theoretical yield. I can be able to calculate the percentage yield. Percentage yield is actual yield divided by theoretical yield times 100, which is that over that times 100, and I get 65.3% to three significant figures. So this brings us to the end of question 4 as well as the end to this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.